Happy to have everyone gathered this morning. We're thankful for our visitors to be with us. I think all who gathered in the fellowship with Fitch Hatcher yesterday in Huntsville had a good time. I think there, someone said the count was about 82. And we had three very good lessons. We extended appreciation to the ladies for doing what they did, but we certainly appreciate the three speakers who did so well. We appreciate the message that was uh, presented concerning the importance of the Bible. I hope that this particular lesson will, especially to those who are on the Wednesday night auditorium class and Sunday morning, will tie in some things because we've been studying from 1 Peter and Hebrews regarding the sufferings of the children of God, remaining faithful because one must suffer as a Christian and not give up the faith and what that means and what we must face. Last Sunday morning, we dealt with a sermon on the blood of Jesus Christ and the significance of the blood when it comes to our redemption, for it is the shed blood of Christ that one has applied to him or her when they become a Christian or they wouldn't become a Christian. It is the blood shed for the remission of sins. Now, this sermon this morning deals with the cross of Jesus Christ on Calvary. And, of course, that's where our Lord shed his blood, uh, the New Testament. He said that when he was instituting the Lord's Supper which was shed for the remission of sins and which purchased the church, Acts 20 and verse 28. Paul, in writing to the church in Corinth, had this to say in verses 18 through 20 of the first chapter of that letter. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written... I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Now these verses set forth the fundamental nature of the cross of Jesus Christ. All of the spokes of the wheel of divine truth center on the cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Eliminate the cross from the Bible, and really, the key to understanding it is destroyed. Listen to Revelation chapter 5, rather lengthy reading. You might want to take notes as to the books, chapters, and verses, but Revelation chapter 5, Read with me, beginning in verse 1 and down through verse 10. Revelation 5, 1 through 10. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within. And on the back side, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book, and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us and our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. 
We read also from Luke 24, verses 26 and 27, where the Lord is talking to the two men after his resurrection as they go into Emmaus. And the scripture says, Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? This is Jesus speaking. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Beloved, the cross is man's supreme hope, and without it there's simply no hope of heaven. The cross stands at the center of the Bible. It is fundamental, it is basic to all Bible preaching. Writing again to the church at Corinth, Paul penned in chapter 2 as we have it, in verses 1 through 4, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and the power. Again, 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 4. The pulpit that is not committed to the proclamation of the cross and all that that implies, and this would be true of any teaching done by the church, any class, anywhere, is powerless as far as the purpose of our God is concerned. Jesus said, and John recorded it by inspiration in John 12, 32, to emphasize the importance of the cross. He said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Nothing has the right to the name Christian, which means of Christ, that is incompatible with the cross of Jesus Christ. When the church loses touch with the cross and all of that implies as you study the last will and testament of Christ, which remember, he said his shed blood was the blood of the New Testament then that church loses its power and every member who loses sight of that loses its power. Now, with that in mind, I would like for us to notice the term that's used, some, concerning the suffering, the intense suffering of Christ, and that is the baptism of suffering. When you begin the study of this, you'll see that there are only, only three passages that speak of Christ's suffering on the cross of Calvary as a baptism. We read some of them now. But Jesus answered and said, You know not what you ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, We are able. He saith unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of my cup, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left, which had been their request, is not mine to give. But it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. Matthew 20, verses 22 through 23. Then in Mark's record, in chapter 10 of Mark, verses 38 and 39, But Jesus said unto them, you know not what you ask. Can you drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? And they say unto him, We can. And Jesus said unto them, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of, and with the baptism that I am baptized with all shall ye be baptized. And then Luke's account in Luke 12 and verse 50. But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how am I straightened till it be accomplished? Well, it's interesting to say the least and quite instructive to look at the very environment or context in which these verses find themselves. 
And I would like to do that for a while, and I think it will make these verses even more important and certainly emphasize greatly the study of what the Bible teaches concerning the cross of Christ and its great significance. Both Matthew and Mark place these comments we've just read in the context of James and John asking to sit one on the right hand and the other on the left when he comes into his glory. Matthew 20, 21. Now, neither one knew what they were asking. Matthew 20, 22. James and John had not come to understand the nature of the kingdom that Christ would establish. Their thoughts were still on an earthly kingdom like Israel of old was. They just didn't have the right concept of the kingdom as to its nature. They still thought of it as a kingdom like uh, people would be in as kings and princes and hold great places of honor. But the kingdom that Christ came to establish is a spiritual kingdom. It's not temporal as the Jewish kingdom and other kingdoms were and are. And may I emphasize this in passing. Premillennialists, those who think Christ came, the Jews wouldn't accept him as Messiah, thus he set up the church, and they make the kingdom one thing and the church something else, and that when he comes somewhere out in our future, he will then set up the kingdom. They are still making the same mistakes that James and John did. They're looking for an earthly, temporal kingdom. The thoughts of James and John were foreign, completely foreign to the nature of, of the cross. The idea of premillennial earthly kingdom also represent, misrepresents, I should say, misrepresents the cross. It is significant that Jesus did not correct James and John by telling them that their request couldn't be given because the kingdom had been postponed. Now think about it. If what we understand the doctrine of premillennialism is that Christ came to set up his kingdom. But since the Jews rejected him, thus they caused him to go to the cross. The Bible's plain on that. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, crucify him, crucify him. There never would have been a cross. Well, think about that for a minute. There never would have been a cross for Christ to die on. If premillennial doctrine is true that he came to set up a kingdom, that if he had set it up, would there have been a cross? Well, then how was his blood be shed? Now, when you remove the cross from the Christian system, you remove the blood that was shed for the remission of our sins of the Christian system. The whole thing collapses on that without any further argument that uh, Christ came and the Jews rejected him, so he couldn't set up the kingdom, so he set up the church, and they don't recognize the church and the kingdom are one and the same. Just different terms describe different aspects of it. And yet he's to come later, even ahead of our time, or on in the future of our time, to set up the kingdom. But the cross was a part of the divine scheme of redemption, just as much as Jesus being born in this world was. Let's look at the background for a moment. The first verses of Matthew 20. Matthew chapter 20 is a parable of the laborer in the vineyard. The thrust of the parable is that the blessings of the kingdom are not based upon merit. In other words, I can't do anything to cause God to pay me with a paycheck of salvation. But it is based upon God's favor or grace that I don't deserve. Sometimes, and you've heard me say it, I've heard certain apostates in the church say, well, you and the people in the church of Christ never preach on grace. Well, I don't know where they have been all the years, but I've been at it for around 50 years. And as a child, I remember the truth preached on grace, but I never did hear the false doctrine of salvation by grace only because that's not preaching the New Testament teaching on grace. Listen to what you have Matthew 20, 14 and 15 giving the background of these verses about the, the cross of Christ. Take that thine is and go thy way. I will give unto this last, even as unto thee, is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? Again, Matthew 20, 14, 15. Now, follow with me. In verses 17 all the way to verse 19, our Lord tells what will happen to him when he goes to Jerusalem. 
He describes the suffering that awaits him in Jerusalem. And that's an amazing thing in their minds. They can't conceive of it because of this false concept they have of the nature of the kingdom of the Messiah. Because the blessings of the kingdom are not based upon merit. Folks, there must be another way. There has to be another way. And that way is described in these verses 17 through 19. The background of Mark is the question of how to inherit eternal life. Christ told the man to sell what he had and take up his cross and follow him. Take up his cross and follow him. Then Christ warned his disciples of the danger of riches in this world's goods. Peter reminded Christ that they had left everything. They had left all to follow him. And Jesus told Peter that no one sacrifices in vain for him. But he reminded Peter that sacrifice will come with persecution. Mark 10 and verse 30. In Mark chapter 10, verses 32 and 30 through 34, Mark also gives Christ's statement concerning his trial and his crucifixion in Jerusalem. The background of Luke is the importance of faithfulness. In Luke 12, 42, And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord will make ruler over his household, to give them their portion of meat in due season? Luke 12, 42 again. Now, in verse 49, Jesus said, that he came to send fire. And then in verse 51 explains the significance of the word fire in verse 49. The baptism of suffering pointed to the cross of Calvary. The cross will bring suffering today if one is faithful in his responsibility to the cross of Christ. The background then sets the stage for the statement of our Lord in which he refers to the cross as a baptism. The context gives the occasion and makes it exceedingly clear that Christ used the word baptism in a figurative way. Of course, they had to know that baptizo meant a burial and a plunging beneath or they wouldn't get the particular figurative manner of being immersed in suffering, it was so terrible. So he would be immersed. He would be buried. He would be overwhelmed in suffering on the cross of Christ. James and John asked for, remember, privileged places in the kingdom. Now, why? Let's remind ourselves. Well, they didn't grasp the meaning of the suffering that he had spoken of. In missing the meaning of our Lord's words concerning his suffering there in Jerusalem when he died for us, they also misunderstood the nature of his kingdom that he would establish. Thus, the cross is essential in understanding the kingdom and down goes the whole premillennial system. Premillennialism cannot be reconciled with the cross. Not at all. Although there are many errors, a multiplicity of them, in the premillennial teaching, no error is more basic than the complete failure of that system to see the kingdom in the light of the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, if premillennialists are right, as I said earlier, but I said again for emphasis, if they're right in their claim that Christ came to set up the kingdom... But the rejection of the Jews led to the postponement of what he came 2,000 years ago to do, but didn't do it. Then it must follow that the cross would have been avoided if they had accepted Christ. That is, the Jews had accepted him as their Messiah. If this is true, then the cross is not a necessity in our salvation. And may I ask some premium leaders, how? Could, uh, how God would have, have saved man if the Jews had accepted it. If every Jew had said, you're the Messiah spoken of, 
We're going to praise you and there is no cross because we're not going to cry out for the power of Rome to do what we can't do since we are conquered people to crucify you. How could salvation have been possible without the cross? Now you see why I wanted to deliver that lesson last week on the blood. There'd be no blood shed for the remission of sins if there was no cross. There would be no cross if the Jews had accepted Jesus according to the false premillennial doctrine that says he came but he couldn't set it up because they rejected him. So he set up the church, a different institution altogether in the kingdom per the false premillennial doctrine. Of course, I could ask this too. What if he comes up again they still won't accept him? They never seem to think of that. And they have as much right to reject or accept him now if that doctrine were true as they had a right to reject or accept him then. So what's to say they wouldn't reject him? Well, the whole thing is a mess. But this is one of the ways to make it clear such can't be as far as the premillennial doctrine is concerned. The word baptism used to describe the suffering of Christ on the cross shows clearly the relationship between sin and suffering. One of the deceitful characteristics of sin, of the transgression of God's law, and your part and mine, 1 John 3, 4, and all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23, and the wages of sin is death, separation from God, Romans 6, 23, is that it offers pleasure and satisfaction, but it pays off in suffering. Now, I want you to think of something, beloved brethren, and any here who are not Christians. Every transgression of God's law, no matter whether it's little in your side or big, cause the suffering of Christ on the cross. The baptism of suffering also indicates the intensity, let me underscore that word intensity, of the sufferings of Jesus Christ for the sins of the world. Now please hear me on what I'm about to say because I'm not taking anything away from the physical suffering of Christ on the cross. But I'm saying sometimes in dwelling on that we fail to see a, need of greater, a, a greater suffering, even a greater suffering of Christ on the cross. It's not unusual, and I've done it myself, nothing wrong with it, to hear preachers and others describe the terrible agony and physical suffering and shame of Jesus Christ on the cross of Christ. And that's good. We should have something of the knowledge of the scriptures about that when we're partaking of the Lord's Supper. We're to show forth his death till he comes again and partaking of the bread emblematic of his body and the fruit of the vine emblematic of his blood shed on the cross. So one cannot deny that crucifixion produced tremendous physical pain. But I have you to understand and think about this that the real, genuine, down deep suffering of Christ on the cross was not seen and is not seen in just the physical pain. But it's in his suffering for sin, for he knew what sin was better than anybody else. It was the intent, soul, and mental anguish for why I am on this cross. Now, you want to see that? Well, we've read it to you many times, and we've all read it, and it's beautiful. 700 or more years before Christ walked this earth and went to the cross, the great Messianic prophet described that suffering of the soul, of the spirit, of the mind of Christ. Listen to what we have, and I'll read just a few of the verses of Isaiah chapter 53. It was the fact that he suffered for the sins of others, you see. Suffering for the sins of others. The innocent and just for the unjust. In Isaiah 53, 3, notice, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Not a thing said there about physical suffering. Now, I'm not taking away from the physical suffering. Please misunderstand me. I'm trying to add to it a suffering we don't consider many times as we consider rightly so and ought to consider it more of the physical sufferings of the Christ. 
Look at verse 4. Surely, listen, he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. That was all on the heart and the mind of our Lord upon the cross as he physically suffered. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Can you imagine, and I know we can't, but I ask it for emphasis, what was on the mind of the Christ when he went to the cross and suffered. We look at verse uh, 10, and we see, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. And then look at verse 12. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Now watch it. Here's where it all sums up. Because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors and bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Folks, if it is terrible and horrendous and shameful and agonizing, when we describe what our Lord's body went through, compound that a million times over as to what his spirit went through. So if you do anything when you consider the physical sufferings of Christ, let it cause you to know what he was doing in his mind. And yet he bore it all. And we sing a song that says he bore it all. It makes the suffering of Christ even more horrendous and amazing when you consider what happened in his own mind. Now to show you how that happens, have you ever struggled with things yourself in your own mind? Have you ever struggled and wondered and laid awake at night and pondered? Well, of course you have. Now sometimes that happens when it's not a matter of how do I carry out the will of God. But I'm speaking of when you have prayed and poured your heart out to God and you prayed for strength to do what only you could do to be faithful. Then we might just a little bit understand what went on in the mind of Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. And what it means when he says, and take up your cross daily and follow me. If the chief suffering of the cross had been physical, then think how that Christ could have faced that the same way Stephen, the first martyr, faced the stones in Acts chapter 7. The anguish cry in the garden was not in anticipation, though it was involved in anticipation of great physical suffering only but it was in anticipation of the bearing of the sins of many. And thus we have in verse 12 of Isaiah 53 again, Therefore, in the light of everything the prophet said concerning what Messiah must do to save us in his suffering, therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many. And he made intercession for the transgressors. To emphasize the physical suffering of the cross of Christ. And to ignore the heart suffering for sin. That went on in the mind of our Lord. The Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. Is to miss the complete and vital meaning of the cross of Christ. When James and John told Christ they were able to be baptized with the baptism, they, they didn't understand what they were saying, and what we've said thus far should help us understand that. They would indeed be baptized with his baptism. That is, that they would suffer for truth and right and in opposition to evil. But there was a special sense in which Christ's baptism of suffering was singular. The suffering of Christ on the cross in relation to the forgiveness of sins stands completely alone from all suffering. Now go back and sing the song once again. We sang a moment ago. And you'll see the writer brought this point out. Because it mentions how he alone did what he did. And nobody else could do it. A life of sinless obedience had to precede Christ's suffering for sins. 
in order for the suffering of the cross to provide forgiveness. His sufferings on the cross was just as peculiar to him in his sinless life. The suffering of James and John would add nothing to the cross as the price of the forgiveness of sins. While James and John did not add anything to the sacrifice of Christ for sin, they still would face as godly men being concerned about not compromising the truth of baptism of suffering. They would have their cross to take up daily and follow Him. Is there any significance in Christ use, uh, using the word baptism in describing, as we discussed last week, the shedding of His blood, His atonement on the cross, and the fact that it is by baptism that one reaches the meritorious blood of Jesus Christ? That's what Paul's saying in Romans 6, 1 through 5, and oftentimes we miss it because we're emphasizing baptism in waters of burial. Nothing wrong with that. We don't miss what Paul's really saying. It seems to me that there is importance in the fact that he calls his suffering on the cross, intense suffering, a baptism. Notice the words crucified and buried in Romans chapter 6. Read Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 also on the matter. We won't have time to do all of that. Though the suffering of Christ on the cross was peculiar to him, and one suffering cannot add, that is, as a Christian suffering for the cause of the gospel, add anything to it. Christianity still demands suffering. And that, my own brethren, have failed to see as a part of godliness and faithfulness. Colossians 1.24, Paul wrote to the church there saying, Who now rejoice in my suffering for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ. You know what Paul's saying? Christ died and he finished his suffering. I'll now take up being faithful where his suffering's left off. Mine will continue. It is behind the afflictions of Christ, my flesh, for his body's sake, which is the church. Do we believe in suffering for the body of Christ? I don't know that we do, Colossians 1.24, because too many of us take offense at people not liking us, and we quit, whatever it is. In 2 Corinthians 1.5, For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. Maybe it's here that we fail to grasp some of the significant fundamental meaning of Christianity and what it is to properly and correctly scripturally wear the name Christian as a member of the blood-bought body of Christ. One has a tendency to draw back from suffering. Could it be that this is one of the reasons for the tendency over the years of the Lord's church to compromise the doctrine of Christ? Has evil let down in its battle against truth and right? Has the devil accepted the gospel and the church with its stand for purity and holiness? Or have many of us compromised in order to avoid suffering? Consider the multitudes in the church today. Multitudes, I say, who seem to think that if anything is inconvenient, then happy suffering. Just inconvenient. They are relieved of all responsibility. I want to read some passages of Scripture that we've already studied on Wednesday night from 1 Peter. Peter wrote, saying, For what glory is it if when you're buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently. But if when you do well, you suffer for it, ye take it patiently. This is acceptable to God. For here unto, even here unto, were you called. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps. 1 Peter 2, 20 and 21. We continue to read over in chapter 4, verses 13 through 16. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he's glorified. 
But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Well, let him glorify God on this behalf. As we draw things down to a close, do you not think that we've been weak in this area at least to understand the suffering of Christ on the cross at the time that he shed his blood for the remission of our sins, which is the blood of the Testament, which is the blood of the New Testament, the blood of the covenant. And without the shedding of blood, the Hebrews writer says, there is no remission. It is the blood we contacted when we had believed in Christ on the basis of the gospel of Christ we understood, Romans 10, 17. And complying with the terms of pardon, we repented of our sins, Acts 17, 30. And confessed our faith in Jesus Christ, Romans 10, 10. And we were baptized into his death where he shed his blood and there the blood is applied. And thus the remission of sins is ours. And when we raise to walk newness of life, the Lord adds us to the blood-bought body, the church. And where was the blood shed? On the cross of Calvary. And what did the Lord say to all of us in being faithful? Well, Paul said it, first of all, to the young preacher Timothy. All who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So why is it a strange thing for the church to suffer persecution? It's a part of faithfulness. It's a mark of what you are. It's a mark that you have the right to honestly wear the name Christian. Truth and right have suffered at the hands of evil since sin entered the world. It's still true. If you've watched television this week, you have seen sin magnified a thousand times over and then 10,000 times 10,000 over. And the world magnifies it. And everybody agrees with everybody, though they all believe doctrines contrary to one another. And while their devotees are killing one another throughout the world, they kiss one another on the, key, on the cheek with the kiss of Judas. In a world of evil, it's not possible for one to live by the principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ and not suffer for the cross of Christ and take up one's cross daily and follow him. We sing the song, Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No. There's a cross for everyone. And there's a cross for me. When you make up your mind that being faithful to God and all that the New Testament teaches and the whole Bible concerning being faithful to God, then suffering is all a part of it and a mark of your righteousness. But beware when all men shall speak well of you. That's another story indeed, and you saw that hat works this week. This song states the truth. We sing it. But I ask you now as to your devotion to God through the gospel and your determination to keep the glad tidings of Christ, let come what may. Where is our cross of suffering in view of how much is said about it in the scriptures? If you're not a Christian, we've studied what to do to become a Christian. If a child of God, you thought you could be faithful, and every time a bump in the road came up, you said, well, they don't love me, I quit. You're not going to heaven. Just mark it down. You're already well on the road to torment because you don't understand. For whatever reason, you don't understand what it is to faithfully wear the marvelous name proclaimed to the ages that the children of the living God would wear, and that is Christian, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else, Christian. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.